I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and here today with me is Richard Carlton, CEO of the CSE. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you here. Well, my pleasure, Charlotte. Really good to be speaking with you. And what we're going to do today is take a little bit of a look back at 2023 and a look ahead into 2024. I know this has been a little bit of a difficult year for many of the early stage companies that we work with at InvestingNews.com. So where I thought we could begin is just by getting your take on the health of the Canadian markets, trends that you've been seeing there. Well, it's been an interesting juxtaposition, if I can use that uh, big, long word, uh, through the course of the year in 2023, because we've actually seen a uh, large number of companies join the Canadian Securities Exchange over the course of the year. Uh, by the end of the year, we will probably have listed in the neighborhood of 100 companies which is down from last year's 122, but still, uh, looking back over the history of the exchange, is uh, pretty darn good in terms of the number of new companies. So what that tells me is that uh, uh, good projects, good management teams are attracting capital. It's not easy. We, kn we know that. But uh, there are funds available and companies are able to raise that pre-public finance. Now, if you want to talk about the specific challenges, though, is that once they do list, we haven't seen a lot of love from the investment community yet uh, for that cohort of companies that have joined the exchange, say, since uh, 2021. Um, certainly, the valuations have been challenging. Um, and of course, as you know, many of the companies are from the natural resources exploration sector, in particular, the battery or energy metals. And uh, many of these companies are actually working projects that were maybe first drilled 50, 60, 70 years ago and uh, in fact are generating some really encouraging results from their phase one and phase two drill programs. The challenge for the companies is that they've not received much um, uh, asset appreciation from the markets. So as they continue to raise money to advance those projects, they have to do so at levels that are quite dilutive to the original shareholders. Um, so that is a really a kind of a frustrating uh, kind of environment for the management teams because Yes, they did win the lottery, as it were. They managed to get that pre-public finance. But once public, as I say, it's been very challenging for them to, to build an audience and to uh, see the value of the work that they're doing measured by an appreciating share price. I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the theme that I've definitely been hearing about. And it really sounds like companies are kind of between a rock and a hard place where, of course, they want to raise that money and move forward. But when they do, they don't get the recognition. So hopefully that's something that we see change in the near future. I want to ask a little bit more about sentiment among CFC listed issuers. And maybe if you could talk a little bit more about some of the conversations that you've been having with these these companies. Well, again, what I just said is, the, uh, is really the theme, uh, particularly from the uh, companies involved in mining exploration. Um, similar feeling in many respects from the cannabis world too, which is still an important part of the issuer community at the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, again, a number of companies, both in Canada, the United States, and in fact, internationally, are making real progress in developing their businesses. And uh, especially in the United States, where we have some of the largest multi-state operators which are listed on the exchange, um, they are taking advantage of more and more states, uh, legalizing adult recreational use of cannabis, which opens up new markets for them. And as time goes on, of course, they're learning how to work more and more efficiently uh, in an environment where they can't consolidate their supply chains across uh, state lines. So um, we, we've seen tremendous uh, sales growth uh, from a number of these companies. What we haven't seen is an appreciation in their share price. And so uh, it, the, the movement seemed to be driven not by the fundamentals of a particular business, but by the sentiment that's generated by potential changes to the status of cannabis at the federal level, whether that's a rescheduling of cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, which would have important tax advantages for the companies involved in the space, or whether it's a progress on access to banking and other financial services, or obviously outright federal legalization. Um, any movement on any of those fronts generates a tremendously positive uh, reaction from the investor community um, who seem more focused on that than they do on the actual business fundamentals of the particular uh, particular companies. And again, 
management is kind of frustrated by that because uh, uh, they should they are justifiably proud of the progress that they've made in developing the business, and they're just not seeing that reaction uh, from 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 the marketplace. Um, it's also true that uh, companies in and when I say the technology space, that obviously means a lot of different uh, areas, whether it's things that uh, you know relate to uh, blockchain or cryptocurrencies or artificial intelligence or uh, the data management uh, uh, applications and so on. Um, again, um, and this is true not just on the Canadian Securities Exchange, but really throughout uh, the public markets, uh, frankly, in North America. Um, again, not a lot of uh, turnover very difficult for management to develop a following, uh, particularly in the retail space. And uh, again, not very attractive uh, share price performance over the course of the last uh, year and a half or so. Yeah, a really good point, especially on what might make cannabis investors take another look at the market. Just to follow up there, because we have an audience that's very interested in the mining sector, what do you think ignites investor interest on that side? Because we have the gold price just historically high, and you'd think that might help us out, but it doesn't really seem to be. My pet theory is that uh, really much of what we've seen is tied to the rise in interest rates. So I uh, uh, had our research team uh, plot uh, turnover uh, on us, and I think on some of the other exchanges in Canada, against uh, increases in the overnight rate. And there's almost a perfect uh, correlation, or maybe it's a negative correlation. I don't know. I, did, I didn't take that course in math. But but what I'm saying is that uh, as soon as the overnight rate began to go up, we began to see lower and lower rates of retail participation in the markets. And uh, I think the catalyst or one of the significant catalysts will be, regardless of the fundamentals of a particular business or area of the, of, of the markets, but will be uh, signals from the central banks, Canada, the United States, uh, that interest rate policy is going to soften. And I think you saw that in, even just in the last couple of weeks in the, um, in the in the larger cap parts of the markets where the Fed basically said, okay, yeah, we probably hit the peak. And uh, now they're going to lower them uh, kicking and screaming. Um, but I think there's a lot of smart men money betting that uh, interest rates will begin to come off as early as the first quarter of next year. And I think there's a lot of reasons, uh, some of them economic, some of them political, that that is likely to be an accurate assessment. Um, and I think that will be an important catalyst uh, for retail investors to begin to uh, uh, pay attention uh, to the uh, to the space again. Um, again, it, it is a mystery to everybody in the mining space that uh, we know that there is going to be a tremendous increase in demand for copper, for nickel, zinc cobalt, lithium, graphite, and the various rare earth uh, metals. Um, yet, the underlying commodity price really hasn't begun to price in that anticipated demand. And so, yes, uh, I think as you see, the, you know, again, as, as the commodity prices begin to appreciate, that too uh, will be, I think, a, an important catalyst. And that may also be very well um, uh, correlated to the interest rates as well. Okay, a lot of a lot of good points there, and I think a mystery is a very good way to describe it. I want to touch a little bit more on some concerns that we see among the companies that we talk to, and one of those is short selling. I think companies see that impacting their share prices, their ability to progress, and I wondered if there are any comments you would share on that note. Well, I think there's uh, we we have a lot of thoughts. Uh, we've obviously been working very closely with the regulators uh, over the last several years because uh, you, you're absolutely right. Every one of our uh, issuers is concerned uh, and probably believes that uh, at one time or another they've been uh, the target of uh, of an organized uh, short selling campaign. Um, and and when we've worked with the regulators to try to identify to to shed some light on on the practices that may or may not, in fact, indicate that there is um, uh, inappropriate uh, short selling. Because short selling is really part of the whole liquidity profile. Like we know for a fact that when short selling is banned, uh, as it was for certain stocks during the global financial crisis, you saw an immediate collapse in liquidity for those names, spreads got wider, far fewer players were prepared to trade those names. So you know, banning short selling is not the answer. I mean, what you're looking for is is reducing or eliminating 
predatory short selling or people taking advantage of, of, of the rules in ways that the spirit doesn't, in fact, intend for them to, to operate. So I'd say over the last couple of years, uh, in, in conjunction with the regulators, we have identified some practices that they have, I think, quietly behind the scenes begun to work with the dealers on. And uh, there have been a number of papers written publicly. I realize that's cold comfort for uh, for our issuers who feel that they're really getting uh, beaten up uh, in the uh, in, in the markets. But I think uh, again, we 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 identified I think where the source of the issues are, and the regulators are watching. They genuinely are, and you will see some proposals brought forward. One of the areas that um, it, 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 in, in potential changes to the way the so-called buy-in process is operated. Now, I realize I'm getting into the back office here and uh, your viewers are probably not all that interested in what goes on uh, in, in there. But the way it works is that if you fail to deliver securities again to, to your counterparty who's showing up with cash, um, there is the ability for the clearinghouse to basically ask for a buy-in. And what they do is they publish um, uh, a number of shares that are required in order to satisfy the shortfall that the seller uh, had in delivering securities to the buyer. Now, and they do that, they induce that by offering a premium to market for other people to come up with those shares. So the problem is that in the United States, a buy-in is mandatory. So if on T plus two, you don't show up with the securities, you're going to get bought in. And of course, that that uh, the premium that has to be paid goes against your account. So there is a distinct disincentive for the dealer to not, um, or to there's a distinct incentive for the dealer to show up with the, with the stock on the day that's set for settlement. Uh, in Canada, it's optional, and you know we do have concerns that in fact that optionality is being used to potentially facilitate the creation of maybe significant short positions in certain companies and uh, you know facilitating the kind of activity that uh, issuers are worried about. The other concern that people have is the Canadian markets are not as transparent as they should be. And so, you know, here at the Canadian Securities Exchange, we're a startup exchange. And one of the things that we knew right out of the gate that we had to begin working on was ensuring that our data was available on Reuters and Bloomberg and all of the different services that provide uh, information on trading and company fundamental data to all investors, whether it's the professional trading desks, the institutional investors, portfolio managers, and retail investors that you know, basically are looking maybe through their online broker or Yahoo or Google Finance to see what their favorite stock is up to at a given time. Um, now, the problem is in the United States, it doesn't matter that a stock can trade in a lot of different places. The same is true in Canada. Hey, your stock can trade uh, on, on one of the TMX exchanges. It can trade on NASDAQ Canada. It can trade on a thing called Trade Logic. It can trade in a dark pool. It can trade on CBO Canada. It can trade on the CSC. The problem is not very many people have access to all of those data services. In the US, they do. And so what happens is if I'm running CSC listed company or company that's listed on another exchange, and I can't see the trading activity that's happening in my stock, I assume that somebody's up to something. And I think better transparency, uh, a system that would in fact provide a consolidated view of trading in the given name and show where it happened and at what price and at what volume uh, would be an enormous step forward in rebuilding confidence in the public markets. So I'll get off my data <laughs> soapbox for a second, but. But again, I think it's a genuine issue because, again, as we speak with the company management teams, they wonder maybe only 50 or 60 percent of the trading activity takes place on the CSC. Where's the other 40 to 50 percent? They can't see it. And that's a and that's a problem that we need to address. Yeah, no, I appreciate the level of detail. I do think these are important issues to go through, especially if, if there are things that companies are asking about and facing. So thank you for Absolutely. addressing that. Yeah. Every conversation is uh, is along those lines. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other one that I think is a little bit connected to this that I wanted to bring up is algorithmic trading. I think that we see companies asking about this. They're worried about this, especially, you know, with the rise of AI, there's, there's more conversations around that. And I know AI is very exciting in some ways. But 
algorithmic trading, if you could, if you had any thoughts that you would add there? Well, algorithmic trading is a term that covers a whole range of sins. Um, <laughs> so again, like anything, there's probably good algorithmic trading, and then there is algorithmic trading that might not be in the interests of the best interests of, of the markets. Uh, by and large, uh, every uh, sophisticated uh, participant in the marketplace is using advanced technologies to operate their trading systems. Uh, think about uh, folks, for example, who are working uh, the arbitrage trade between Canada and the United States. Uh, again, they're using a lot of computing power and some very sophisticated network technologies to ensure that, uh, again, if there's a different price available in the United States for the same stock in Canada and vice versa, that that difference is eliminated almost immediately. Now, we like that sort of trading because, again, it makes markets fairer. And the activity of the arbitrage uh, uh, folks uh, actually deepens the market, increases the liquidity, uh, improves price discovery in many ways. It certainly narrows the spreads. Um, so that's a that's a good thing. Um, I think people think about uh, uh, strategies which may not, in fact, uh, uh, be in line with uh, accepted conduct in the markets. Um, I don't know how often that happens. Uh, understand that the regulators themselves have extremely sophisticated surveillance uh, technologies that are watching literally every message that's going into the market. And uh, uh, again, if you're getting away with something, trust me, you're not getting away with it for very long. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I don't, by and large, let, 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 me, let me say that the application of technology to support trading on uh, on balance is a, a tremendous positive uh, and not something that we need to be, uh, you know, worrying about that the, that the house is getting burnt down. Yeah, and my apologies. I know that was a broad question, but I think it's a good way to ask it because you you bring in the nuance of the good and the bad and see how they kind of stack up together. So again, thank you for going through that. And so looking at, at the markets, you've done a great job of explaining the situation in Canada and among CSC companies. What what is the CSE doing right now to support companies during these times that might be a little bit a little bit tricky? Well, many of the things that we've done uh, from from the inception, uh, we're going to be celebrating our twentieth anniversary as an exchange uh, next spring, uh, which is a uh, tremendous uh, uh, achievement uh, for the folks that uh, many of we we have a number of folks that have been here really from the beginning. Uh, and to survive against the competitive onslaught of uh, uh, some very, very large and well-funded competitors, not just domestic, but you know, international and global, um, this was really quite a, uh, 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 an achievement for the organization. And I think one of the things that uh, really did set us apart is the level of customer service and insight that we bring to the table as we work with companies that they come into the markets and then as they're listed on the CSE. So we do a variety of things around issuer education. We do what we can to uh, alert them to different opportunities to, to raise capital. Uh, we've, I've traveled extensively over the course of this year to anticipate where they're going and to try to help plow the road ahead of time. Um, there's a good Canadian analogy for you. Uh, but for example, a few weeks back, I was in Australia. We have a lot of companies that are raising capital in Australia. And uh, investment funds may have had some concerns or didn't really know much about the CSC. Well, you know, we're certainly there to fill that uh, that knowledge gap and to uh, eliminate or assuage any concerns that uh, people might have. There, in in some cases, there are some arrangements that we can make with the local regulators that reduce the friction and cost associated with potentially accessing capital and maybe listing in a in a foreign jurisdiction. So those are the sorts of things that uh, that we do. Um, we have a uh, as I say, a number of uh, events, largely virtual at this point. Uh, they used to be in, in person more, more and more. But uh, again, where we uh, look to uh, uh, educate uh, uh, our issuer companies as much as possible on, on a range of topics. Um, and uh, as I say, we'll certainly uh, continue that uh, with vigor uh, uh, into uh, 2024. Yeah, and I think you've kind of started to go down this road already. I was going to ask about initiatives from the CSC in 2024. I know I think that this year the big one was launching that senior tier back in March. So any any further comments you would add there? 
Well, it wasn't just about the senior tier. Uh, that was the first major rewrite we had of our listings policies uh, from inception of the organization. So there were a lot of updates that we needed to make. Um, and, and working with our partners at the, uh, the regulators, principally the Ontario Securities Commission and the BC Securities Commission, to uh, you know, address some concerns that they had had. Um, you know, we obviously brought a lot of learning to the table, too. So it wasn't just the creation of the senior tier, you know, again, looking to be able to handle companies throughout the full life cycle from startup to maturity, essentially. Um, but um, again, uh, we, we raised our initial uh, listing standards. We provided a lot more clarity in, on the requirements for a variety of companies, especially in the mining space. Um, there are areas where we have increased the required distribution, as in the number of shareholders that people need to have before joining the exchange. So really, it was about us applying what we've learned over the course of the last 20 years to try to provide a better public market experience uh, for, for, for the issuers. Um, we don't have anything quite so big or grand uh, in, in the hopper for 2024. Um, we're certainly going to be implementing many of the uh, components of, of the new rules at working with the issuers and the auditors, the investment bankers, and the lawyers who support them to ensure that they best understand uh, how to uh, uh, work with us in, in this new rule framework. Um, the other thing is we will continue to work with our issuers to help them identify new sources of capital. Um, Canadian issuers have really good access to the United States and uh, uh, for prospectus exempt capital, even though they're not reporting issuers in the US. Um, so there are a number of avenues that you know potentially are mining companies and, and others can access using their Canadian public uh, uh, company status. And, and so we'll be leading some seminars with uh, partners uh, from, from different parts of the uh, ecosystem to help teach, to, you know, to provide the knowledge uh, of potentially some of these, uh, some of these techniques. So, so those are the sorts of things that uh, we'll be uh, looking to uh, continue to do in, uh, in, in 2024. Um, it's worked so far uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have an excellent pipeline of companies uh, as we go over the year. So I can, tell you with pretty fair assurance that uh, uh, Q1 and Q2 next year are going to be pretty solid as well. Um, and if we do get a bit of an interest rate uh, uh, decrease, as I say, I think the uh, the pipeline will fill even further. Very good. And I think connected to that, we, of course, have a strong Canadian audience, unsurprisingly, but we do have global investors who are looking at our website. And one question that we get from them sometimes is, you know, if I am from a different country, how do I invest in these companies that are listed in Canada on the CSE, for example? So briefly, you know, any any thoughts on that for investors? Yeah, that's a question we get a lot, of course, uh, as well. Um, there, there are two ways, um, actually three ways now that I come to think of it. If you're a bigger investor, uh, Canadian brokerage firms will open an account for you. And... Uh, uh, unless you're from the United States, in which case they probably won't because of the uh, uh, know your client and any money monitoring forms that have to be filled out, uh, as well as uh, potential registration with the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States. But for non-U.S. Uh, investors, as I say, large investors will always be welcome at a Canadian brokerage firm to open the account. Um, it is uh, uh, something that we have been working on, again, from from our inception 20 years ago or so, is on building that range of, of international dealers who, who provide access. Uh, we have a list on our website, www.thecse.com, and uh, there are brokers that uh, do in fact cover the, uh, uh, the exchange uh, internationally. And uh, again, we hope to be adding to that list. The other way, which is kind of backdoor, but it is actually for many people very successful, is we have uh, about five or six companies which are interlisted with NASDAQ or on NASDAQ. And so just about everybody around the world has access to NASDAQ. And so those companies, and, and again, those uh, uh, companies are identified on our website, uh, the CSE.com. Um, the uh, rest of the companies are quoted on the over-the-counter markets in the United States. 
And many of those issuers are actually on the QX and the QB, which are for, uh, call them the regulated boards, if you will. And many investors have access to those names internationally. Now, they trade under different stock symbols. It'll be a five-character symbol ending in the letter F, which denotes foreign security in the United States. But again, many investors will have a U.S. dollar account uh, which means, and, and of course, the companies are trading in U.S. dollars on the uh, OTC in the United States. Um, and uh, as I say, the vast majority of our companies are there. Uh, and because of the cross-border arbitrage opportunities, there's usually quite a deep book and a fairly significant amount of daily turnover uh, in, uh, in the names that uh, are listed on the CSC. So that's the other place that people should look uh, when they're trying to... Uh, uh, trade CSE names. And in fact, that's probably the most likely way uh, or the easiest way for many people to do so. Oh, okay. Very helpful. So if, if people do want access to these companies, there's a very good chance that they'll be able to get it. All right. As we're finishing up here, I want to ask if there's any final thoughts that you would share with investors heading into 2024. And perhaps we can talk about if there's any areas of strength that you see in, in the markets. Well, I think, uh, again, as I said, we have pretty good three to six month uh, look ahead in terms of the applications that uh, are under review uh, with the issuers uh, or from the issuers at this point. And uh, I would say that uh, the one thing we know for sure uh, is that uh, critical minerals are continuing to be funded uh, by uh, investors and they pre-public round. Um, so again, and, and again, these projects a uh, wide range of, uh, of metals uh, in, a, in a wide range of places. Um, but if I had to say that there was a particular theme, uh, politically reliable is the, are, the, are the two words that keep coming up. So, you know, and, and in fact, we're probably maybe only at this point talking about Australia, United States and Canada uh, and uh, maybe a couple of other jurisdictions. But, but that is going to continue to be a theme. Uh, into uh, 2024, uh, for sure. Um, again, I think as you see interest rates begin to come down, uh, my suspicion is that we will see a broader range of companies from the technology space uh, also seek public funds. And uh, because again, it's been pretty tough and, and public capital has been fairly expensive with interest rates where they're at. Um, so again, as we start to see better share price performance and some more liquidity, um, again, I would expect many companies which have been on the threshold maybe for a year and a half, two years at this point, actually uh, do decide to uh, to take the punch. So there's potential uh, for 2024 to be, in fact, a very strong year uh, for the public equity markets in particular and uh, for the CSC specifically. Okay, I think that is a great place to wrap it up. So thank you so much for coming on to share 2023 tw trends, 2024 outlook. Really good to speak with you. Thanks again. My pleasure. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Richard Carlton with the CSE. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts. So leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.